This film explores the influence of philosophy on the human experience. It is based on interviews with philosophers and thinkers at the Riyadh Philosophy Conference in December 2021 at King Fahad National Library in Riyadh. The conference tackled the most important topics facing humanity in the modern world, including ethics and morality, scientific advancement, and the rapid acceleration of technology. The annual conference, under the patronage of the Saudi Arabian Ministry of Culture, is a platform for intellectual and cultural exchange amongst international and local philosophers and thinkers through lectures, dialogue, readings, workshops, and exhibitions. Philosophy impacts us all. This film is produced by FII Institute, a global non-profit foundation with an investment arm and one agenda: impact on humanity in the areas of AI and robotics, education, healthcare, and sustainability. Robots don't have any difficulty, you know, with uh, dealing with that. They do not face an ethical dilemma. Being human has to do with having to make choices, uh, choosing between two options. And when you make a choice between two options, you don't forget about the one that you didn't choose. That still remains. Some of the issues we have seen. Um, in various elections, and the way that social media has played into that um, has been largely determined through algorithms. Um, and I do think it's a great threat because one interesting example, a quote comes to mind, um, the philosopher Jürgen Habermas, um, and he was talking about how the language we use to communicate and understand each other, and have kind of a consensus about. These big questions、um, can be suddenly used against us,、um, and he calls this systematically produced misunderstanding. And the reason I'm bringing that up in regards to your question about about AI in,、um, is one of the great problems is that that model of kind of being able to kind of keep on the lookout because his idea is you know being able to kind of use a public sphere to be vigilant about when we're being duped when. Misunderstandings been produced systematically.、Um, is that changes fundamentally with the emergences of te new technologies like we see now? This being, this human being, whether it's half leg or artificial leg,、mm. an artificial heart, and so on,、um, is endowed with sp、uh, with spirit. And that's what makes the difference. The spiritual being. And has an ontological relationship, yeah, with、uh, the creator. You were saying to me, "What about as you know, more and more complexity is able to be gathered in data?" I think it it actually reminds me of what we were talking about earlier with the Stoic thing of knowing what's within our power and without. It may be the case that at some point in the future there is a singularity, or there is this moment of computer sentience, and, and I think I think you know. On a very simple note, it's almost like wait and see. I think, although there's a lot of talk about artificial intelligence, I think that much of it is ill-conceived. I think it would be helpful to compare artificial intelligence with animal intelligence. Now, it's also worth considering the etymology, the origin of the word intelligence, from Latin intus legere, to read into, to read inside. So. We speak, or some people speak, of animal intelligence. Now, it is true that animals know things; they have cognition. Many have memory and、uh, imagination. Some animals, chimpanzees, can be trained to distinguish between、um, triangles and circles and squares, but they will never form a concept of what a triangle is. They will always respond to a physical object here and now. The quote that comes to mind is by Flossel M. Sjöen Kierkegaard, and he's not somebody you'd necessarily normally think of in relation to questions of AI and robotics. But he comes to mind for me because he says at one point that truth is not how you define a concept, it's rather how you relate to a concept. I'm paraphrasing very roughly, <laughs> but what I take from that is there is something about you learn.、Um, coming back to education, right? You learn about what's right. And wrong. You learn about what's true through experiencing it,、mm. not through simply abstractly defining it. 
And I think that's, to me, why it's an interesting connection to the, the question of AI and ethics. I think when a, a soldier is on a battlefield making a decision, there's a human experience um, there. His body's learning, his mind is learning, uh, her body's learning, her mind is learning about that experience of what it means to be in a war zone, what it means to pull a trigger, make a decision. And I think the experiential learning aspect can't be taken out of the of ethical questions. And so I think you can't um, predetermine what is ethical and then put it into an algorithm or put it into a, um, a drone and the drone follows certain parameters because you always need that flexibility of that experiential learning that we as human beings have. Well, I, I have an answer to that question which might sound uh, a little bit paradoxical perhaps, but I think that we have already discovered extraterrestrial uh, life and actually we are the very embodiment of the possibility of an extraterrestrial time. I mean, if we start from the Big Bang to the present era, let's say the whole universe at some, at some point, let's say, was, was, was one more, one, one little singularity that then exploded and we, we, we bear the trace of, of this kind of uh, uh, original, uh, uh, let's say, uh, scene. And furthermore, we know that there are lots of forms of life. I mean, it's, it's complicated. What is life, you know? But that eventually passes through our atmosphere. Scientists have discovered bacteria coming from, from other, you know, uh, other places than, than the Earth and so on and so forth. So, I mean, the contact of extraterrestrial life is already there. The illusion would be that this contact would take the form of, you know, Steven Spielberg, you know, uh, first encounter of the third kind, you know, and suddenly, suddenly there would be a green creature and we would have to communicate. Probably the, 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 the most defining encounters with extraterrestrial lives that we could imagine would be sublinguistic or, or submolecular or on the contrary to a scale that we could not even uh, uh, master or, 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 or see. And, uh, and, and, and that's why I'm, I don't mind imagining, you know, future contacts um, because, yeah, I think that they've already happened and, and, and we are somehow, uh, a part of us is already the result of that. So what is distinctive of intelligence is that it conceives what is the nature, what is the essence of a triangle? What is the essence which distinguishes a triangle from a circle? And an animal can never do that. So we use language frequently in transferred meanings, in diluted meanings. So this is the case with when we speak of artificial intelligence, AI. We're using the term in a very loose, a very pale sense. It's approximative. So uh, we can train or we can feed, we can encode computers with all kinds of information. But a computer can never reflect back on what it contains as encoded. So a computer can have the signs which latently can be interpreted by intelligent beings uh, as filled with meaning. Yes, you're quite right to say Heidegger spoke about being in the world. And you're also quite right to integrate in this being in the world an ethics, because there is an ethics to Heidegger's philosophy. Sometimes this is uh, uh, overlooked by scholarship, but there is a true ethics at work in Heidegger's philosophy. Now, it's a particular kind of ethics. It doesn't have anything to do with morality. It's really an ethics that seeks to place in, in conformity with the word ethics, which mm. comes from the Greek ethos, which means place, to place the human being in its origin. It's in authentic, origin. Now there's a whole there's a whole construction here by Heidegger and Heidegger does mark how the human being placed in its authenticity will discover, reveal a modality of dealing with others, of dealing with nature, of dealing with technology, right? And of course in Heidegger's great essay on the essence of technology, he typifies technology as the danger. Why is it the danger? It's the danger because technology reduces the meaning of being. So does a book. Mm. We don't speak of books as intelligent. So what's the difference between a computer, a robot, and a book? The robot 
again, uh, will be trained to respond mechanically to different impulses, electric and so forth, maybe to, to, to light and so forth. But uh, it is not something, it is, doesn't have its own inner nature. Now, Heidegger wants to return to an originary ethics, an ethics where technology is suspended, bracketed out to reveal an authentic mode of relationship with others, with being itself, mm. with the world. So I think we can use the term artificial intelligence and animal intelligence in a very diluted form, but strictly speaking, it is a nonsense. Well, let's take an obvious example. Take um, self-driving cars. I mean, there's a really complicated question of insurance and liability. If I'm in my self-driving car, you know, in the future, which is, could be tomorrow, and the car is driving itself and it's, you know, uh, road tested and it's been approved by federal agencies, etc. But nonetheless, the car gets in an accident. Mm. So who sues who? Uh, Manufacturer, the driver. I mean, is it is it the company that made it? Is it the company that programmed the driving? Right, because that's also something different. Mm -hmm. I mean, when here is fanciful talk uh, about, well, will robots usurp humans? Will we lose our freedom to robots? Of course not. You pull the plug. You know, you turn off the energy. It's nonsense. It is just fantasy uh, in the minds of people who, you know, there may be good imaginary science fiction writers, but they fail to recognize the distinction between uh, the like, transferred metaphorical uh, and the logical use of such terms as intelligence and so forth. So uh, there's no such thing as artificial intelligence. Robots do not have rights. We need have no fear of robots. They will be useful to help us in many tasks. They will relieve our, like the drudgery uh, and the labor of, um, of human life uh, that we can, uh, you know, enjoy the higher things of reflection, art, culture, literature, and so forth. I mean, laws always are dependent on values. So part of it is what kind of values ha have to be um, um, established, have to be perpetuated, such that then uh, there can be norms and laws that, that regulate the relationship and behavior of robots, AI, and, and human beings. In order to grow as humans, in order to learn to be human, is try to minimize conflict and try to turn it into kind of a mutual understanding, mutual effort to understand. Mutual understanding is a very easy sentence. It doesn't mean much. You have to put a lot of effort in understanding each other. And that's what we, I think, are supposed to do. And that's what philosophy helps to do. Il y a plusieurs très grands bénéfices à enseigner la philosophie avec les enfants. D'abord, il, il y a un fondement qui est éthique dans la philosophie avec les enfants, c'est de considérer l'enfant comme une personne, comme un sujet. Euh, les enfants se posent des questions philosophiques. Ils sont dans ce qu'on appelle l'étonnement devant le monde. Tous les parents éducateurs savent que 4-5 ans, c'est et pourquoi et comment. Et dans toutes ces questions-là, il y a des questions qui sont vraiment philosophiques, sur l'amour, sur le bonheur, sur la mort, sur la morale. Et donc c'est déjà prendre en considération, reconnaître, un enjeu de reconnaissance, reconnaître l'enfant comme une personne, comme un être humain, qui a le droit à 4, 5 ans de se poser ces grandes questions-là et d'être accompagné par des adultes pour essayer de donner du sens au monde dans lequel il grandit. Um, if I may try to anticipate your next remark, I don't think philosophy can change things by itself. Nothing can. Human life is too complex to have just one discipline or one science or one drive change everything. But it certainly can help. <laughs> بما يفهمه عن العالم وبسوء فهمه عن العالم أيضا والمدرسة تكون مصدر ومكان إنه يعطيله أدوات تسلح لمواجهة هذه الأفكار التي لديه
هو هذا اللي نبغاه احنا من المناهج المدرسيه لذلك نحن نقول احنا ما نبغى نعلم الطفل محتوى فلسفي احنا نبغى نعلم الطفل محتوى يعني احنا 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 ايش نبغى نسوي احنا ما نبغى نعلم الطفل لا تواريخ الفلسفه ولا اسماء فلاسفه ولا نستعير منهم اي شيء سوى فقط ادواتهم الفلسفيه مهارات التفكير العليا ما نبغى الطفل يتأدلج ما نبغى نكلمه عن الفلسفه النسويه ما نبغى ندخل في راسه افكار عن اي اسم اللي احنا نبغى نسويه انه احنا ناخده في مسار يستطيع انه هو يستقصي يرصد الافتراض وهكذا بي ابري يا ان انجو كي بوليتيك اوسي سي ان انجو ديمانسيباسيون لا فيلوزوفي سا ديفلوب لوفيرتور ديسبري سا ديفلوب ليسبري كريتيك سا ديفلوب لو ديالوغ انتركولتوريل اي سي بور سا كو يونسكو سوتيان لي لي براتيك دو فيلوزوفي افيك لي زانفان باسكو ا ترافير سيت براتيك لا اون لوت ا لا فوا كونتر لو ريلاتيفيزم مي اوسي لي دوغماتيزم دونك سي اون فاصون اوسي دو فير فيف دي فالور هومانيست دو ديالوغ انتركولتوريل ديالوغ باسيفيي انتر لي كولتور Donc, enjeu éthique de reconnaissance de l'enfant et enjeu politique de développement de l'ouverture d'esprit et de l'esprit critique. Do it. Can we live without philosophy? Yes. Probably we live better with philosophy than without. We can live with basically without everything except for food and house and 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 reproduction. But these things help. You can live without literature. You can live without poetry. You can live. in an animal way but that's not what we want anyway um, I, I i mentioned the word effort i think that's a key point we do not naturally dialogue with each other we do not naturally uh, feel the need of controlling our passions our anger our desires something that we have to learn and If you look at the human history and its diverse civilizations, this is what basically all civilizations have described as civilizing humans, learning to be human. Exactly, this openness to talk to the other, to listen to the other. So I think that we shouldn't look at it with too much nostalgia. Le monde qui existait avant Internet, c'est un nouveau monde, et je pense qu'il faut apprendre à approprier, s'approprier cet outil qui peut être à la fois un formidable outil parce qu'on a accès à de l'information rapidement. Euh, les enfants peuvent avoir euh, des informations qu'on n'avait pas nous avant. C'est aussi un danger, bien sûr, parce que c'est une accélération permanente. Il faut apprendre à se servir de l'outil. Et l'esprit critique. Mais justement, c'est une façon de déguiser notre esprit pour comment faire avec cet outil, parce qu'on ne reviendra pas en arrière. Cet outil, il est là, on va vivre avec, et euh, il faut apprendre à bien s'en servir, à s'en servir avec euh, avec sagesse. أنا جاية من تخصص Sociology of Childhood أو علم اجتماع طفل وندرس فكرة الحق حق الطفل في التعليم وهي كلها أفكار صراحة مثيرة للجدل من ناحية إنه هي تؤسس لمفهوم عن الطفولة متمركز حول فكرة نقدر نسميها universal أو عالمية عن الطفولة بينما في حقيقة الأمر الأمور ليست كذلك فبدأ اليونسكو الآن يتصور ما نسميه بخطاب ال best interest أو الحالة المثلى بالنسبة لسياق الطفل فلما نتكلم عن حق الطفل عن التعليم نتصور معا أسرة تعيش في أفريقيا وهذه الأسرة فيها ثلاثة أشخاص مثلا بيروحوا المدرسة وفيها واحد من الأطفال مضطر أنه يروح إلينا القرية القريبة في البئر الذي يبعد ثلاثة كيلومتر كل يوم حتى يأتي بجرة الماء لأسرته حتى يستطيع أخوانه الباقيين أنهم يدرسوا لو كان موافق على هذه الفكرة فهو يتعلم أن يتعايش مع أسرته لو كان هذا الشيء يحصل بشكل دوري في الأسرة أنه واحد من الأسرة يضحي من أجل أن يدرس الباقيين كل كم شهر فنحن نتكلم عن نظام ليس فقط تعليمي نحن نتكلم عن نظام اجتماعي يخص بيئة معينة ويس ويعني يساعدنا نفهم أنه النتائج ليست بالضرورة كما إحنا نتصورها أنه هو هذا طفل مظلوم أو محروم إذا كان هو موافق إذا كان أسرته تعلمه التضحية إذا كان هو مساهم على فكرة الطفل إذا سوشيال كونستراكت تعريف الطفولة قبل 1800 كان الأطفال مساهمين رئيسيين في الإنكم حق المنزل بدخل المنزل بعد أن بدأ التعليم الإجباري 
بعد ان بدا التعليم الاجباري صار الطفل كائن سلبي تماما يروح المدرسه ويرجع عليه ما يصير عمره 18 سنه ساعتها يبدا يصير شخص مستقل وقد يساهم في دخل المنزل او لا ف يعني مفهوم الطفوله مفهوم متغير باستمرار احنا اللي نبنيه واحنا اللي نكونه مفهوم المساواه ايضا في صيروره مستمره ما وصلنا لنهايه وحتى نستطيع ان نقول انه هذا الشكل النهائي للمساواه الذي نتمناه جو بون جوستومون ان براتيكان de la philosophie avec les enfants et toutes les pratiques qui vont développer l'intelligence collective, par exemple. Je pense que c'est très important d'apprendre aux enfants à coopérer. Alors, ça ne se fait pas seulement par la pratique de la philosophie avec les enfants. Il y a plein de pédagogies hein, qui incitent à la coopération. On vit dans un monde aussi où le temps est accéléré, très individualiste, très matérialiste. Je pense qu'il faut offrir ce que Anna Arendt appelait des oasis de pensée. Enfin, c'est le lieu parfait pour parler d'oasis hein, ici. Une oasis de pensée, c'est des temps, des moments où on s'arrête, on fait pause en quelque sorte par rapport à l'affairement et l'urgence du monde et on essaie de réfléchir pacifiquement, sereinement ensemble sur les grands enjeux qui nous unissent les humains parce que nous sommes frères de questions philosophiques. Quelle que soit notre culture, quel que soit notre âge, on se pose tous des questions sur l'amour, sur le bonheur, sur la liberté, sur la justice. Il y a un lien fraternel dans le questionnement philosophique. Donc prenons le temps de nous poser, créons des oasis de pensée pour tous les âges qui nous permettent de, de vivre ensemble de façon la plus pacifique possible. Education, for instance, is not just listening to a professor. That's a big part, but then there is an interaction between students. You have to be in the same class, discuss, talk to each other. If everybody stays home, you, you create second row uh, quality education. And that's something that might be very dangerous for the future. You give people the illusion that they get an education, but actually they get a bad quality. And you will have a small amount of people who can maybe pay more mm. and actually go in person and have a higher level of education. Can you teach the children to teach the children? Matthew Lippmann, the director of the program of the philosophy, who always says, live the children in a time of poverty and poverty for the knowledge. But I don't agree with this statement. If you asked me a question, I would say that the children of this time are more than us. In the past, you had several ways to describe it. Uh, classic philosophy has described it as generosity. There's a beautiful Greek word, megalopsychia, magnanimity, big soul, open soul. Today you can use vulnerability, but all these tools are tools that help people connect, interact, dialogue. Probably the right way to try to reach a kind of a solution is to try to give up egoistic uh, attitude, trying to see that by thinking for the for a common good as it was now, is also the best way to think for our own good. Think of the vaccine uh, problem, for instance. In Europe, where I come from, everybody went crazy for the vaccine in the last year. All we were waiting for were vaccines. And who cares about the rest of the world? And that's the most idiotic attitude. And now people are realizing that this thing is not anything you get out by yourself. You have to make sure that everybody get, gets vaccines. And if everybody doesn't, you will keep having problems at home. Any time people try to ensure uh, that civilization continues, things tend to go wrong because you put a stamp on this is what civilization continuing means. Yes. In this particular way, it's spelled out with this group of people, this ideology, etc. And so I think it's important to have that stoic mind where we say, you know what, maybe ensuring the, the continuation of civilization is, um, beyond. Is, is beyond just simply me, but rather I can take it one step at a time and work with others because we hope that will happen but we can never ensure it. You don't act globally if you think only within your own mindset, with your, within your own cultural tradition. And that's where philosophy and the humanities in general help a lot, because they help seeing things from a plurality of points of view. 
And this is not a luxury, this is a fundamental tool for human progress. I think I would be very stoic about that answer. So one of the, the early stoic philosophers, Epictetus, um, said that one of the most important things that you need to learn is those things which, which in, within your power and those that are not. I cannot imagine uh, that the question of time would eventually change anything about how we manage time. Meaning by that, that the principles we apply, the type of behaviors that we have, uh, the choices that we make, um, we seem to have proven to be very bad at changing things with time. So I, I wonder whether, you know, the fact that uh, we, uh, we jump from, I don't know, 70 uh, or, or 80 years uh, of life to 500 would help us reach wisdom, or on the contrary, like, you know, in some, uh, you know, science fiction novels like the ones of Michael Moorcock, you know, the cycle of the end of times, where people would simply get bored and, and, and be, you know, in an even worse situation than, uh, or make even worse choices than the ones that we, uh, that we have been making, so yeah. I think real evil is inequality. That's pretty clear. Um, I don't know how things will turn, but there is something fundamentally wrong in the way how we live. Uh, we cannot stand this level of inequalities anymore on a global scale. The history of, of mankind has been the history of the adaptation to life in its circumstances. And the very idea of a house, for instance, is a tool of resistance against uh, the, the, the situation of life and death, you know, the fact that, you know, mastery of fire and so on and so forth. So I would be very optimistic in the sense that since it has, own, it, it has been our, our only activity, and even art and culture is a way to pass the torch uh, in order to, to somehow manage our movement, you know, in a, in a, in a world which is fundamentally hostile, you know, uh, to us. I, 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 I think that at some point we will remember that and, and then look at the situation that is ours and instrumentalize this inheritance of, of fighting and, and, and fighting for our lives in, in this situation of, of generalized uh, life and death uh, matter. Yeah, I, would be, yeah, I, would, I think I would be optimistic on that. Look, if you imagine yourself in the past, in a past, in a, in a, in a, sorry, in a, in a faraway future, mm. and think of the difference between Bronze Age and today, it's not much. Uh, in terms of, yeah, for us, it might be very different. We are still at the very beginning of a flying era. Uh, we are still using very primitive uh, energy production means, and we are still in a very early stage of human connection. So I think it says that we are still very old in the sense that we belong to the antiquity. Uh, will we be able to go forth and develop a human civilization, maybe colonizing other worlds? I think we may. I think that all the chances are open. But it would be nice if we stop thinking of ourselves as the most clever living beings on Earth or in the universe and think of ourselves as very imperfect species that is still at a very, very early stage of its existence in in, in the universe history and in the earth history as well. Think of nature. Today, we are finding out very, very radically and powerfully that nature, that nature is in a way rebelling against the manner in which we've treated it. So countries who have a, so to say, an optimistic outlook on their future do invest in the humanities and see how humanities can help develop their human potential. I think humans are precipice creatures <laughs> and so we tend to kind of end up changing at the precipice of disaster. Um, I think something like philosophy helps us to maybe reflect that we're coming up to a precipice mm. and perhaps realize that we need to do stuff before we're literally falling off the precipice. Um, so there I would say that there's at least four conditions that um, um, are conditions that allow for human flourishing capacity. So being able to exercise those capacities through which I come to realize who I want to be. One is, let's call it biological. So vaccines is clearly 
that if I don't have, you know, proper health, if I don't have access to proper health care, mm. if not, I'm not able to, you know, maintain my biological organism, virus, etc., then of course I'm not able to exercise the various kinds of capacities that, that define me. And therefore we ought perhaps to rethink this predominance of knowledge over and above nature, this domination over and above nature, and find a manner of speaking to nature, of thinking nature, which would not reduce its unpredictability, which would not reduce its unrepresentability, which would not reduce its secret to our conceptual representation of what we think nature ought to do for us. The second, I would say, is, um, let's call it financial basis, because one of the great sources of inequity is financial inequity. In terms of access to capital and access to financial resources that then allow someone to build infrastructure uh, that through which then they can exercise their, 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 their various capacities. So not just you know, redistributing wealth, but redistributing access to capital, which is quite different than just wealth. Um, so I would say that a more humanitarian society would be one where there's more equitable distribution of access to finance, access to capital. It would mean that perhaps responsibility, ethical responsibility, justice, comes about when I don't recognize the other when I don't reduce the other to my conceptual representation of the other. Perhaps, perhaps, to reduce the other to my conceptual representation is a violence in itself. And therefore, to rethink ethics, we must perhaps mm -hmm. take the line of the non-recognition. Perhaps to be ethical is, I don't recognize who you are, what you are, where you're from. I don't recognize your ident I don't ask you for your identity papers when I meet you, but I am still just towards the unknown, towards the unknown in you, towards the unrecognizable in you. Perhaps that's the true ethical question today. How to be just, how to be ethical towards what is unknown in the other, what is unknown in the other human. Um, the third condition, I would say, would be ecological. So ecological not only in terms of nature, but in terms of sort of the environment in which then individuals um, are, you know, are living and pursuing and exercising their capacity. So that, of course, that would include nature as well. So I would say a more humanitarian society is going to bring about a kind of uh, equity, um, justice of ecological conditions. So certain, you know, certain countries, certain neighborhoods, that have more high levels of pollution, lead poisoning, et cetera, obviously that's going to be a challenge for individuals just to have you know, progressive and, and flourishing lives. And then the, the fourth one would be intellectual conditions because one of the capacities that, that, that you know, people develop is intellectual capacities, artistic capacity, cultural capacities. Um, and there again, you have conditions, like if you don't have proper education, if you don't have proper internet that gives you access to knowledge, we're sitting here in the library if you don't have access to books. So I would say, in brief, a, more, a path to more humanitarian society would be where these four conditions, let's call it biological material, um, financial, ecological, and intellectual, which are conditions for the flourishing and exercise of human capacities. So. The, the, the idea here is to develop a novel ethical ideal yes. which, which accepts, which exposes itself to the other's secret, to that which will never be public. In other words, an ethics which looks at the others, the other humans, intimate being and cares for it and does not seek to reappropriate that being to Archer. to make it part fit. to make it fit exactly to make it fit in a type of narrative where we would be exactly and always already the same oh yes that makes sense so basically it's not obliterating the individual it's incorporating it and forming a new identity from that it's it's forming a caring for that which refuses to settle 
for what is already formed, whether it be a community, whether it be uh, whether it be a, a, a tradition, where, whether it be a history, yeah. to care for that which is always other than where you want or I want to reduce the other. And then from that, you'd have basically establishment of pure justice in terms of there's no differences. There are differences acknowledged, but there's no uh, conflict from that. That, in in other words, there would be an idea of there would be an idea of justice, a type of utopia. You see how the difference with Heidegger is radical because for Heidegger, ethics means ethos, which means place. Here it would be a type of utopia, where what we would save, what we would seek to save, what we would care for, is that utopic, that non-placeable place of the other human for the other human. That which is unplaceable in the other human and therefore that which is irreplaceable in the other human. See, because one of the, one of the, one of the major problems with uh, Heideggerian ethics, if you like, mm. is that as soon as you place the human in what is an originary place, the other human becomes Separate. replaceable. Yeah. What I'm here speaking of is to care for that which is unplaceable in the other and therefore irreplaceable. Thank you.